Welcome to Drink Beer, Think Beer, the podcast that gets to the bottom of every pint. I'm John Hall, and there's a lot happening inside of the walls of Cleveland, Ohio's Noble Beast Brewing, and all of it is good. On this episode, it's a conversation with owners Sean Yasaki and James Redford about food, hospitality, creativity, and tradition. First, please visit allaboutbeer.com for original articles, reviews, news, insights, and podcasts. You can listen to shows like Beer Travelers, Brewer to Brewer, and the All About Beer podcast simply by searching All About Beer wherever you listen to shows. This show and all of the work we do, it's supported by you. Please go visit patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. There, a few bucks goes a long way to help keep the content fresh and to fund writers, photographers, creators, and editors. And if you'd like to learn more about advertising on this show, please email info at allaboutbeer.com. Speaking of that, we'll get into the show in just a moment, but first, Ryan Sharp is here. He is the producer of the Best of Craft Beer Awards, which is a sponsor of this episode. And Ryan, welcome. I, I've had the chance to judge these awards in the past. And you know I'm not actually blowing smoke when I say that I was impressed with both the professionalism of the process as well as the caliber of my fellow judges. Clearly, I was the weakest link at the table at the time. <laughs> but for, for those who are unfamiliar with the Best of Craft Beer Awards, tell the brewers listening about it and what it offers breweries. Ah, all right. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, we uh, – what it offers is we attract a lot of the same judges as the other big competitions in Denver and elsewhere. And so entrants are getting the same caliber of feedback. Uh, and we provide table notes from the mid and metal rounds so they have a better idea why their beer did or didn't advance. And we think there's value to that beyond the initial judge feedback. So what's new for the awards this year? Uh, this year, we've added a smoothie sour category and a collaboration category that's judged as kind of its own separate thing as a best in show format. All right. You're going to be back with me at the bottom of the show to talk more about the awards. But for now, brewers, go register your beers through January 31st of 2024 by visiting bestofcraftbeerawards.com slash register. Seriously, don't delay. You can learn more about the competition and get your beers signed up by visiting bestofcraftbeerawards.com slash register. It was a snowy Friday morning last week when I walked into Noble Beast Brewing for the first time. It was warm and inviting, an industrial space with plant life all around. Art and mementos on the wall felt purposeful and important, not haphazard or trying to make an artistic statement. The beers were right up my alley. Lagers, properly made from equipment specially designed for the brewery and built for decoction mashing. Horizontal lagering tanks are just out of sight, but they're there. And already, heavenly aromas were wafting from the open kitchen. Soon enough, I was at a table, and across from me was Sean Yasaki and James Redford. They founded the brewery in 2017, with Sean helming the brewery and James the kitchen. Together, they have built a destination brewery in downtown Cleveland, not far from the stadiums and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's got a neighborhood bar feel, and within a few minutes of opening, even with a few inches of snow already on the ground and more falling, the locals walked in, settled into the bar, and started in on a few pints. Sean likes traditional lagers and brews them well, but he also puts his all in on other styles, including award-winning Baltic porters, fooders against the wall, or aging barley wine, saison, and an excellent Flemish red. The brewery is a family business. Sean's wife, Jillian, she runs the operations, human resources, and accounting. And in the kitchen, James has a familiar mix of bar dishes and some practical ones. He has a passion for local farms, and the menu changes seasonally. And it's the kind of menu that is so detailed that it also includes spent brewing ingredients and beer in many of them. We talk about all of this and so much more. Here's our conversation. Thanks for having me here. This is this is cool. It's my first time in Cleveland in I think nine years, and walking in here, uh, and we were just talking about this before we went on. But I was sort of struck with the eclectic nature of the place, and it feels very loved, very lived in, uh, very comfortable immediately when you walk in. It doesn't. There's a lot of breweries that have that sort of manufactured feel mm -hmm. to them. This is not that. Um, what do you want Noble Beast to be when people walk in for the first time? 
I is, think, is you, it I think you just summed it up. Okay. Yeah, and, and we've certainly grown into that. Uh, you know, this was a dingy ass warehouse before we got it. And even when we opened up and we look back at photos, it's like, oh my God, how did we open the doors? It's just bare. There's nothing on the walls. It's, you know, it was much colder. You didn't have these hanging plants coming from the skylight. Um, so it's certainly been a process to grow into it. And it's kind of something that, like, our staff has built out, too. You look behind the bar, it's like, that's their world back there. And you encourage that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, when it comes to what you wanted Noble Beast to be when you guys were starting this versus where you are now. Like if you went back to look at the business plan from back then, are you living that or has it changed drastically, dramatically or not that much? I think in a lot of ways we are. I think what's changed the most is the focus on food and the success we've had with the culinary program. Uh, You know, when the business plan was kind of your typical we're going to open up a brewery tap room. It's going to have a small little kitchen. You go up to the counter and you walk away with the sandwich. Yeah. Um, you know, that's been flipped on its head and beginning with the, the quality of the food that came out and the success that that's driven. And then just kind of the way service changed post COVID we're much more of a brew pub restaurant model by this point. And when we first got together too, um, you know, we were, Sean and I were introduced by, um, Zach Tracy from Juniper Brewing. Okay. And, uh, you know, I had been looking to do something with barbecue for like two years. And then Sean has like, you know, pizza written into his business plan. Um, and then we get together and like all these places open up with barbecue and then like a bunch of breweries with pizza too. So we, we had to just pivot and find our own identity at that point. Um, so yeah, definitely not where we had first envisioned ourselves. Yeah. I think three barbecue spots opened up within yeah. like eight months before us and then like a, a, another pizza brewery you know so it's like all right well i guess we're not doing that yeah. anymore um well i mean with all of that right i mean cleveland you can't talk about cleveland without talking about great lakes um and the impact that it's had not only on the area but you know the larger beer world for for, for a pretty long time um was there this desire to have like a new generation of breweries in town that was doing I don't know like keeping up with the times or I'm not saying that they're not but there's I think it can be tough going into a city where there is that 800 pound gorilla uh, and then when there is growth trying to find your own path forward Um, and so it's interesting to hear that you you guys were pivoting before you were even opening because of what the market was already doing you know to sort of find that own niche and how important that might have been you know for you you know I, I I think it might be the opposite okay. as far as, you know, the credit that I give Great Lakes to the city is that we've had an established, um, you know, craft beer consumer base here for a long time. And so it's allowed us to brew, you know, you look at our board right now, there's a smoked Hellas, a Bach, uh, Czech Pills, things like that. Traditional beers that I want to make are sought after here in Cleveland. Yeah. And, and you talk about kind of like, you know, newfangled beers or new trends. <laughs> Um, you'll go to surrounding cities even that don't quite have the legacy of like a Great Lakes in it and half their breweries are hazy IPAs and fruited sours. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. That's just not me. Sure. And that's what their consumer base wants. And in Cleveland, you can, you can push a much more traditional you know, beer scape. Yeah. But also sort of mess around with, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this board as you're talking. So yeah, you have the, you know, there's some great lagers. You have a West Coast IPA, a Belgian single, red IPA. Uh, sweet potato saison, which I'm kind of curious about, <laughs> um, but like all of these, all, all of these things as well. Is there something to be said for diversity of tap lists these days as well? Because when I walk into a place and it's like, all right, here's 12 taps, but eight of them are hazy IPAs. I know that there are some consumers that look for it, but it's nice to have variety. And does that help? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and I think you can you can do that a little bit easier in town here than some other places. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that. And I think that really does go back to Great Lakes in the eighties. Um, and then how has the food program evolved? Um, you know, initially it was all about, you know, just doing this pub fair and then we were going to do everything with fresh ingredients. I've got like a long history in sort of the farm to table, um, movement that's happened around here. Cleveland's in a really good position with that. You've got, you know, a lot of farms are only a half hour drive away kind of thing. Yeah. So that was always the focus in the beginning. Um, and then, 
really what ended up happening was like sort of as we're opening here, you know, this is the first brewery I've ever worked in. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm smelling all these different, you know, weird, weird smells and seeing all these different ingredients and whatnot. And that kind of just got the wheels turning. And we started to sort of ask ourselves some questions like, can we cross over with some of these ingredients? You know, what can I do with spent grain and what can I do with um, hops and, you know, things like that and start evolving that into the food. So it started out as little basic experiments, um, and now it's really a big part of our identity. So what were those early questions? Like, as you were saying, okay, what can I do with hops? What can I do with spent grain? Like, where? Uh, Some of them were, like, strictly about um, the ingredients and the flavors themselves, right? Um, And some of them were about processes. Um, So to give you an example, like... um, you know, there's so much spent grain, right? And it, it's, yeah. it's got this insane, like, nuttiness and, and sort of roasty character to it. Um, that seemed like kind of an easy one. And, you know, there was a lot of pioneers already out there that had been using spent grain. Yeah. Right? Some, some people in town that were, like, making dog biscuits and things like that. Sure. And so, you know, once we found that we could just grind it into flour, it was just like, well, now that it's in flour, I can use it for, like, everything. Yeah. Right? So, um you know, we already had like a, a non bread, like a grill bread that we use for the veggie sandwich. We oh, just fun. put some of that in there, kind of in the same way that like whole wheat, right? Some texture to it. Um, and then we started dusting the wings in it and we dusted the chicken sandwich in it. Um, and now it's, you know, it's just like really part of, of our repertoire entirely. Um, the, the other thing was the processes, right? So, you know, in the beginning, I'm using all this beer directly from the taps to like beer brine and cook with and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and then it just sort of became a question of, a, you know, economics. How can we save ourselves money? Um, and we started figuring out a way to be able to save everything that was going down the, the spill tray. Um, and, you know, now you have sort of this, like, um, enormous pot of this, like, general use beer, right? And it, it, uh, it's obviously saved us a bunch of money rather than pulling all this beer right out of the taps because it's something like what four gallons a week i I was using or something like that for the amount of chicken that we're brining um and it you know it just sort of became like a a new process and a way for us to um incorporate beer without hitting the bottom line with it that's so interesting to hear about the spill tray right because i imagine like in my head i was like oh well that's just waste like why are you going to use waste? but it's it's not it's hitting stainless it's going into a container you know before it hits the drain or anything it's still perfectly good used beer but there there's something in my brain where i was like oh yeah as soon as if it doesn't hit the glass then it's you know it's trash kind of thing um well, yeah there's certainly sanitation concerns yeah. right like um you know for sure the staff has got to like make sure that nothing else is going down there um especially cleaning products and stuff like that yeah sean could probably talk about um sort of the the um way that he set sort of the valves and everything up underneath to like sort of ensure that yeah um there wasn't going to be a problem with that but um yeah for sure you know luckily the spill tray it's just beer over there yeah nobody's dumping a soda down there like anything else um yeah. you know and certainly no um drinks coming from the tables or anything like that but yeah. um yeah like why not i mean it's just a pure blend of of uh usable beer and it also helps too that our you know, collection devices right on the other side of the wall. Um, You know, very easy for us to just put it right back into the walk-in. Yeah. What was it like setting up the valve stem for that? It's just to... It's just a simple little Y valve underneath. Okay. You open one, it goes to your collection carboy, and you close it, you open the other one, it goes down to the drain. Okay. And uh, I think part of, you know, making this work so well is we have such a a consistent front of house staff. There's barely any turnover, so you're you're dealing with only a handful of people who are closing at the end of the night and yeah, kind of making sure that things are done properly. Because uh, that was going to be my next question: is is staff education and staff training right? Because it's just if somebody has worked at another bar where they're not familiar with this, and it's that's not how I've done it in the past, kind of thing. But if you're not having a ton of turnover and you're mm-hmm. taking the time to sort of talk it through. And then I imagine then that that can also be related to somebody sitting at the bar or somebody ordering food at a table of that story as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think that for sure, um, you know, it, it all comes down to like awareness of, yeah, the sanitation aspect sure. of everything for sure. When I'm looking at this list, though, and I'm thinking of everything that might go into that collection carboy, I mean, what... 
what does that taste like at the end of the day? I mean, it feels like that's the old bar dare of, okay, who's going to drink the bar rag kind of thing, which again, I'm not endorsing and certainly not clean, but um, it's got to change over over the course of week to week, depending on what's on tap. Yeah, absolutely. And so like the character, um, for what we're using it for, and you know, um, sort of the diluted method that we end up using it for, it doesn't really matter. Okay. So, um, you know, we're going to take a 25% ratio um, for our beer brine. So, you know, the other three quarters of that is just water. It's a ton of salt. It's some sugar. Yeah. It's a whole lot of aromatics, right? Okay. Like herbs and onions and things like that. Um, so by the time that you've collected all that, made the brine, put the protein in there, then drained it, and then you've cooked the protein, you're going to still get like all of that flavor from the beer. And then obviously the science behind what that's doing to tenderize the meat for you as well. Yeah. And nobody's going to see the subtle differences that are coming week to week that's in the character of it. Because that was going to be my next question. Right? Yeah, it, it, do you ever get diner feedback where it's like, wow, this chicken was really good last week or it's different from it was last week. You know, I came back to it so good last week. So it doesn't hit like that. No, no, not at all. Okay. Yeah. You know, everybody will note just, you know, how, how tender and flavorful the chicken is, but yeah. nobody's going to, you know, why is this, you know, got a little Cezanne in it this week or something like that. You okay. Know? Yeah. I mean, I imagine the Rauch beer kind of hits a little bit different, but um, maybe not by too much. Um, that's really cool. Um, so what else are you guys doing to, you know, incorporate ingredients, beer well, ingredients into yeah, into so the spent, kitchen? Yeah, so spent grain's obviously the biggest. Yeah. Um, you know, it, like I said before, it's, you know, once it's in flour, you can put it into so much other things. How labor intensive is that process? It's really pretty easy. I mean, okay. it, you know, it's about time and whatnot. Um, the whole thing is to like, it comes right out of the lauder ton. You end up um, collecting it and then you've got to cool it down super fast, right? You know, obviously super hot, super wet, tons of, uh, it, it's what bacteria loves to party in. Yeah. Um, so you get it laid out on sheet trays, you put it in the cooler, um, you get enough space in between those trays, you're definitely getting it there in six hours, right, where it needs to be. At that point, you bought yourself a lot of time. Um, but if you get all your ducks in a row, you can go directly from the louder ton right into the kitchen, right in, into the oven. We have convection ovens with fans. Sure. So that completely helps everything get there a lot quicker. And, you know, um, 25 pounds, a um, couple of bus tubs, you can get done in just one day. Okay. Um, and that point, um, it's the grinding can be kind of a pain in the butt. We initially used just a Vitamix blender, did a pretty good job in really small batches, but... Um, we were doing so much at one time that the plastic bottoms of the containers were melting um, <laughs> all the friction yeah. and using it, you know. So uh, we ended up getting a, uh, um, a grain mill and that has helped out immensely. Yeah. You know, you can just spend like an hour and a half and do two weeks worth of spent grain. Um, gets down to really nice fine powder and uh, yeah, that's, that's the best way to go for sure. Yeah, I like that. So you're not getting any of those husks in it that, like, mm -hmm. right. you think of old school, like, pizza crusts at breweries where you're, like, picking crusts or yeah. husks out of your teeth. You or know, even some of those beer flour. bread kits that you used to get, like, you know, it's just add a can of beer and, like, that and it's yeah. like, kind of chewy and, yeah, it, it didn't have a lot of that, a lot of that to it. Um, other than that, you know, we're, we're also incorporating just malted wheat berries as salads. Um, it's a great ingredient for like grain bowls yeah. and, you know, which is like a huge healthy trend for eaters. Hits really big with a lunch crowd. And then they, um, you know, it, it malted wheat berries have an incredible amount of nutrition to them and stuff as well. Um, they're higher in protein than barley and everything too. So that, that does really well for us. Um, and then we use some uh, dehydrated malt extract and liquid malt extract as sweeteners. Okay. Um, and that's, you know, taking some time to play with. Um, I will say also liquid malt extract is like the worst, stickiest ingredient to ever have to use ever. Yeah. It's like, you know, three times thicker and stickier than like honey. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just the worst. But um, we found some good applications for it. Um, and it's just another way to, you know, kind of get that flavor onto the menu and then make the connection between the kitchen and the brew house. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned hops as well, though, which I'm super curious about. Yes. Hops are um, a real pain in the ass, to yeah, be absolutely I was gonna say, yeah. honest with you. Um, so we've, we've found ways um, to kind of circumvent that. You know, um, it's definitely all about measurement and, uh, you know, pellet, 
pellet hops are for sure the easiest to use. I was going to ask um, if it's whole cone versus pellets or what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Whole cone, you can, you know, do some infusions and things like that with them. But overall, it's definitely, you know, once they're, you get them ground to a fine powder, you're using pellet hops that are obviously like the absolute lowest alpha acids you can find. Um, the noble hops are definitely the best ones to use. Um, and then... At that point, you know, very small measurements, half teaspoon into like a six quart batch of something, okay. you know, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. When the hop sales guys come by with their dozen of their little one ounce bags that I don't know what to do with, they go to the kitchen. Yeah. I, c- I can pretty much cook exclusively just from sample bags that Sean gets. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, wh- what, what were some of those trial and errors, right? Because I mean, I, it, to me, like, having spent a lot of time around beer and food pairings and um, you know, cooking with beer and all of that, like the hops were always the most problematic and it was always just, it's probably not worth it, but it sounds like you found a way. Yeah. Um, you know, but were there frustrating days? Oh, for sure. Okay. You know, like it took me a lot of different recipes to finally just realize that trying to do it um, in any sort of hot application is going to fail. Okay. Um, more times than not. Um, and then there's weird stuff like, you know, um, taking a bunch of uh, hops and, and putting it in salt for a week and then trying to flavor the salt. The aroma doesn't necessarily come out the way that you would want it to. Yeah. Um, different applications like that. Um, so um, the, the biggest success we've had is with cures, right? Like dry brining, essentially. So, um, you know, you add, uh, I have a, like a lox recipe. Um, it's got a ton of sugar in it. It's got, you know, a bunch of salt in it. You just add some pelletized hops in there and that actually works well with any kind of hop. It doesn't have to be pelletized in that situation. Um, and then because you're sort of distributing this cure over time, all over the fish, you can get a really good hop aroma and flavor to it. And then you've got all the sugar in there that's fighting off the bitterness as well. Yeah. Um, the flavors go really well. You know, lots of citrus and, you know, things like that kind of match up really well with yeah. the hop, the hop the aroma. Yeah, like, you know, I'm thinking dill and things like that, which doesn't show up in hops, but mm-hmm. complementary flavors, yeah. Yeah, so that was a, that was a big success for us. Um, and then, you know, looking to the future... Um, we're looking into like essences and, you know, other um, distilled oils and things like that. And there's a real possibility there to completely remove all the bitterness entirely, which would be a real game changer. Yeah. Um, I mean, oils for something like a hop water or. OK. Um, where do you see? I mean, Sean, you're shaking your head on that one. Like, where do you see that particular category going? Are you seeing promise like on your level for something like that? That category of like hop, hop products, water. yeah, um, yeah. I think it's pretty interesting. We have we haven't really jumped into that yet. Hop water, but um, actually plan to pretty soon. Okay. Um, and they do they do uh, present a lot of more opportunities for the kitchen. Uh, part of the problem is they're so concentrated. It's really difficult to oh yeah dilute it enough in a repeatable manner to to use. Yeah. Um, what are the conversations like between the kitchen and the brew house? Like if you're planning out recipes Sean to you know to, to to brew with like are you guys talking about that in advance or is it at times if we're kind of going out of the, the comfort zone a little bit okay. sourcing ingredients from the kitchen yeah um, like that sweet potato saison you brought up you know yeah. that's from a local farm uh, so I'm getting that uh, from James um, they're helping roast it all kind of prep a lot of the things okay There'll be a lot of, like, roasting of herbs and um, spices and things like that that Sean will need help with as well, bringing out the oils and coriander and things like that. That's fun. Yeah. As opposed to just opening up the bag and throwing it in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's an interesting thing, right, of getting the most out of the adjunct ingredients and not just whatever it shows up from, from a catalog or something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, have those conversations evolved over time? Like, I, I, you know, I think about roasting coriander, but not as often as... Like, I don't know how many breweries are actually doing that. Yeah, well, I, I think when we use coriander, he'll help source, like, an Indian coriander. Okay. Which has a little bit... I, I prefer the, the character of it. It's just a little bit more unique. Um, you know, they'll help toast it, help crush it up. Yeah. So, And it, go, it goes both ways, too. Like, Sean will find, you know, these big five-gallon buckets of local honey and things like that. Um, so there can be all kinds of conversations as to, you know... Oh, we'll just take advantage of that pricing. And then, you know, we use a lot of honey in our kitchen as well. So, um, you know, why not? 
there's been times too where we'll pull something out of a beer, a big sack of cocoa nibs or something like that, and be like, there's a lot left in this. Like, what can yeah. you guys do with this? And they'll, yeah. they'll figure out a way to dry it out. And, and there's, there's always the conversation too, going the other way, where um, th- we've got to constantly be in conversation, especially with the spent grain. Um, okay. You know, what are you guys brewing? Um, how long in between brews? Um, if you guys are brewing like, you know, two chocolate malts in a row that's unusable product for me i can't go with dark roasted malt it you know you end up frying something in that it's just like it, it's too dark when it comes out of the fryer it's too unappealing it's too bitter okay um like so, visually unappealing as well as yeah, palate unappealing yeah okay. it, i mean it looks burned too right sure. so um you know we got to time things up a little bit um if he's going to end up not brewing for a couple of weeks or or brewing things that i can't use for a couple of weeks then i've got to make sure i'm taking enough spent grain and and getting to that point as well um what about pairings like are you suggesting pairings when folks come in of they're ordering something and not so much i think we actually do a pretty poor job at yeah. <laughs> following through <laughs> to the end on that um the bar staff certainly will will do that, but we don't have it like written out on the menu. Okay. Part of the problem is is that like a lot of what we do is pub fare, right? So it's like sandwiches and things like that. It doesn't lend itself necessarily to, um, you know, great great pairings a lot of the times in 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 those in those ways. Um, certainly when we do beer dinners and things like that. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, for sure, that's a big part of it, but. Um, yeah, we could we could absolutely do a better job with that for sure. In terms of seasonality, right? You were talking about using a lot of the farms. We're here in, in Cleveland, January. Uh, there's not a ton happening. I'm sure there's greenhouses and things like that. But like, do you adjust the menu for the winter months? Yeah, absolutely. And then for obviously for the for the peak summer and fall. We're lucky to um, deal with Tyler Farms, and he's a um, hydroponic guy down in Oberlin. Okay. Um, and so he supplies us with really good lettuces that you can't get, um, obviously this time of year, right? And then of course, you know, um, right now it's about storage crops, right? Apples and mm-hmm. squash, and you know we can get a good amount of onions right now, carrots, you know, cabbage, things like that. Um, but yeah, you absolutely have your most fun being able to do with all that stuff in spring, um, summer, and, and fall, of course, too. Yeah. Um, Sean, when you're thinking about beers as well, right? I mean, it, it, I feel like in some cases we've lost a way with seasonals. Um, you know, you can rely on Oktoberfests or pumpkin beers in the fall, and spring's always been kind of tough, and summer beers are usually kind of lighter. But by and large, when I go into a brewery, these days that has a thoughtful tap list it's just wow this is a thoughtful tap list not necessarily thinking about the seasons mm-hmm. um are you are, are you as a brewer thinking about the seasonality of things or is it yeah i think so okay i mean um we really only carry two consistent beers you know our evil motives ipa and union pills yeah check pilsner um after that everything is a rotating list of what just Basically, brewers want to drink, kind of, kind of deal. You know, we you still a, have that approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got our Bach on tap right now. A Czech Tamave coming out. Um, I think certainly the, the loggers especially, kind of brew at the seasons. And you have a brew house that's built for that, that you've built for that. We do. Yeah, it's uh, it has a dedicated cereal cooker. So, cook corn, do traditional decoction mashes. Um, it's a pretty fun brew house that allows us to, I think, make any style we want and not be held back by the equipment was that something you always wanted to do yeah you know i i think what i really love about like breweries and and building breweries is like being able to design all this equipment yeah like you're if you're buying it new it's it's being custom made for you why not you know really make something unique yeah that was a pretty fun process Um, designed the whole brew house designed our lagering tanks Uh, most of our tanks have some kind of interesting quirk or change to them okay in in and that's stuff that you learned along the way or something that you just had an idea for like what's a good example of that i guess is the question um i guess uh so if you look at the lagering tanks like you know there's nothing too um game changing about them they're just horizontal tanks but uh to my knowledge they're the only ones that have side mounted manways Okay. So instead of being like on the, the head of the tank, they're yeah. just right on the side, and that just fits our space better. Okay. So we just kind of designed things to work well in this space. Um, 
like we were talking about the brew house, you know, it's a, it's a mash mixer, kettle combo, dedicated louder ton. The Whirlpool is below the louder ton. Everybody thinks it's like a little hot liquor tank, like an old pub system. Okay. But it's just being really space efficient in, you know, what is a pretty tight, tight little uh, brewery in here. Yeah. Um, Can I talk about your commitment to lager for a minute? Because... I, <sighs> I was guilty of this in the past. I was like, oh, this is going to be the year of the lager kind of thing. And uh, Ashley Carter at Bierstadt is fond of saying, well, lager's been on a 500-year winning streak anyway. So, <laughs> um, But there are brewers that have put the time into recipe, studying recipes, studying history, uh, to commitment to ingredients, to commitment to equipment, to time, uh, and treating the lagers with respect. And those brewers, I think, stand out in blind tastings, in just general bar sessions, than a lot of folks who, you know, like quite frankly, I'll talk to, and it's like, oh yeah, no, we lager this for two and a half weeks, and it's ready to go, and it's like, oh, it's it's really not, mm-hmm. and it's you know, um, the commitment to equipment, the commitment to quality, the commitment to to, to tradition, um, how important has that been for you? I think it's I think it's really important. Um I love the history of, of beers and beer styles and how they all came to be, how, how they're made now. So part of the the journey, I guess, is not always, it's not always like, how can I make the best beer, right? Sometimes it's, how can I make this the most traditionally yeah. and, and learn from the history of this beer style and make the best beer within those confines? Sure. So you could debate decoction all you like. I love doing it, and we're going to do a double decoction on our, our Czech Pilsner, and I think it, you know, it makes it a distinct beer. Yeah. And you can make it a, a different beer that other people cannot produce. Do the drinkers care? Like, I know I do when I come in, but I'm, I'm weird. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't say that, like, you know, the majority of your drinkers care, but that passionate base does care. And that passionate base is really what, like, goes out and sells your brewery to a lot of people. Yeah. Whether, they might not be the big craft beer nerds, but... Everybody's got one of those annoying craft beer nerds in their life somewhere. And if they're telling you that, it's hey, true. I love this brewery and here's why, you know, mm-hmm. then, then you can pass on that, that appreciation a little bit. Yeah. In asking folks in coming into Cleveland, and again, it was like 2015 that I think I was here last. And you guys were not around at that no, point. No, we opened 2017. Um, but in asking folks in advance where I should go, and I think I was telling you this the other day, uh, you guys came up first uh, by almost everybody that I talked to. Um and it's people that I trust and, you know, even just random people as well. So clearly it's, it's, it's working. Yeah. That, that blows my mind when it's people out of town that are telling you that and not yeah. just like, you know, the locals or something, but yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, it, it, that takes, it takes hard work, right? I mean, you're not coasting clearly. You're always thinking about process or you're thinking about what you're going to brew or what's going to be coming out of the kitchen or things like that. And it just strikes me that, it can be easy for places to just suddenly, okay, we've been around for you know eight years now, and we're in a pretty good groove, and yeah, maybe we don't have to do that the same the same way. It strikes me that you guys still have your foot on the pedal, yeah, as you're doing this. Yeah, we approach every single beer. With, what are we improving over the last batch? Yeah, you know, every process, uh, raw material selection. Yeah, that's that's part of the fun of it too. Yeah, and for the kitchen as well. Like we, you know. We've got our staples that we're never going to get rid of that are on the menu, right? The things that people love and they obviously order a lot. Um, but we just kind of pride ourselves to like try to not repeat anything that we've done on any previous menu in the past, right? And a lot of that is um, I try to surround the kitchen with good talent as well. It's not just me, right? It's, it's the team that's executing it as well. So I've been pretty lucky to have some some pretty great people like come through the kitchen, come with some great ideas, and really have a passion for, you know, wanting to do um, that same mission statement that that Sean and I do. What's the mission statement? Best quality, fresh yeah, ingredients. I don't think we write it down too much. <laughs> um, yeah, it's all. It, this this whole business was kind of built around just being like a bit of a passion project, you know, like. We don't have any, uh, you know, restaurateurs here or, uh, you know, big restaurant investors or groups like that, right? Sure. So it's like, like I'm a brewer. That's, that's that's how I, like, identify, right? Not as an entrepreneur or a business owner. So for me, it's like 
how can we build a business that allows me to make the best beer I possibly can? And that's how he approaches the culinary side of things too. And you know, shouldn't be a big surprise, but it turns out that's how you make a successful business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and a long-standing one too. So, where are you looking for inspiration? Uh, like where, like where? Yeah, where do you look for inspiration when it comes to new things that you can bring into the kitchen? Oh wow! So um, you know, it's a lot of reading. Okay. Um, I I absolutely buy you know any kind of cookbook that I can get my hands on, right? You follow a lot of where uh, national trend, trends are at, especially if like you're you know, thinking about what's going on with international cooking. Yeah. You know, everybody has their day in the sun or their couple years in the sun, right? Like uh, Filipino food is, is hitting pretty big right now. Um, and then a lot of it is just sort of like, I let the farms kind of tell me what they're gonna end up doing, right? And you gotta do some planning ahead for that for sure. Yeah. But like perfect example this last year, um, really horrible melon, um, crop. It rained so much that, you know, all these things are rotting on the ground. The squash crop was terrible. So, you know, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm going to go in another direction, right? It's just constantly evolving in that way. And on the beer side of things, where are you looking for, for inspiration these days? I mean, you got a, you know, check coming out and that's obviously what a lot of people are talking about these days. And um, yeah, so I think a lot of that comes from travel, whether okay with friends breweries, you know, within the country or, or yeah. getting overseas. And, you know, this, this past summer we had the, um, good fortune to go to Czech Republic. And, okay. And oh, you were on that trip. That was a personal or, trip. Oh, personal yeah, trip. Okay. My, my There's some brewers that went on a, yeah. Yeah. No, no. Okay. Um, but that was really cool. And we met a lot of people like, uh, just brewers there, you know, it was, it was an interesting trip where you're just like, it's, it's a vacation with my wife and I, but all of a sudden we're like making all these friends and hanging out with other people, which is normally how our trips go. Yeah. Um, so like this Tamave we just did is a collaboration with a small little brewery over there. Okay. So I got WhatsApp just for this and, you know, we're texting back and forth and figuring out a, a recipe and that, that's been really um, interesting. Um, a so collaboration it, built all over WhatsApp. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like that. It's, <laughs> yeah, we're the future couple, is here, man. We don't have flying cars, but that is, yeah, that's Jetsons type shit right there. Yeah. So we, we've been brewing like Czech pills for, for years now. And you really have, you base that off of like your experiences, what you've had here. Sure. And then when you read about what it's like in the Czech Republic. So you go over there and you drink them all. And it's like, all right, I got a bunch of tweaks and changes to make. So what were some of those changes? Like when you came back from that, that you were, you know, you're um, sitting on the plane just itching to, to get into the brew house. And yeah, you know, we've, we've been tweaking it to, to add a lot more body okay. into the beer. Uh, a lot more color. Yeah. They're surprisingly dark over there. Uh, a little bit less bitterness and less hop character. Balance it out with the malt a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I've actually been pretty happy with the changes we've made. I feel like they're much more in line with what you could drink over there. Yeah. And, and that's got to, I mean, I like that you're always striving for, on, on both sides of things, of the brewery and in the kitchen, of not just resting on laurels and not just, but like looking for that next phase of things. Because if you're excited about what's coming out of the tanks and what's coming out of the kitchen, it's going to resonate to the staff, it's going to resonate to the customers that are constantly coming in as well. And it just, again, it feels like you guys have that juice behind you that is, you know, fueling. I don't yeah, know, I mean, there's, there's no yeah. lack of inspiration in this industry. So it's, everyone else is always doing such creative and inventive things too. That, like that drives you. Yeah. Um, not even just to like feel like you need to keep up, but just it's inspirational to be like, oh wow, you know, like you dry hopped in this manner with this weird product, and like that tastes great. Got to try that, you know. And this is for sure like the fun part of the job, right? Like, um, you know, having to like think about financials and uh, event promotion and things like that like I would much rather be um, having some fun and, and trying out new things to do with the food yeah you're still finding inspiration though and I like that I, I, I feel like that for a while and it was the pandemic everybody had their heads down and was just trying to survive and then you know with all of the growth of the breweries based on hazy IPA that there wasn't a lot of innovation that was happening and I know there's industry leaders who have talked about that in the past and you know even as a journalist going out to breweries i was sort of uninspired by having the same conversation with folks over and over again of like you know yeah it's our citrus mosaic hazy because because it sells well and it's like mm -hmm. yeah but what else are you trying to do it's like oh we don't have to it sells really well and it's like yeah. yeah but there used to be so you're still seeing innovation though you're still you're still getting inspired by by others yeah absolutely i mean i i don't see any decline in innovation in brewing anytime soon or right now at all so is there 
what's it like among your fellow brewers here in town and the kitchens here in town, like in the craft beer space, in the you know, brew pub model, tap room model as well? Are you, is there, I imagine there's friendly competition, um, but also, you know, desire to have your tap room packed when others aren't and uh, get that piece of things. But I, I don't know, is there, I don't know, a good competitive spirit in the city right now? Yeah, I think, I th- I, sure. Um, there's, <laughs> well, there's competition, but sure, like, yeah. but generally, no, I mean, I think it's very friendly. You know, there's, there's always a bunch of text threads going around, people sharing and use malt, whatever uh, thoughts. So I think, I think the, uh, the collaboration is strong. Um, there's been a, you know, it's industry wide, like post COVID, there's, there's less events, there's less beer festivals where all, all the brewers are getting together and actually yeah. seeing each other on a regular basis. So that's been, um, it's been a bit of a bummer, but kind of going my way to, to get people together. Yeah. We started like a, like a brewery fantasy football league. So just literally as a way to just like keep in touch and have a reason to get together and okay. have a little party. Is there, what does the winner of that league get? Uh, they get a banner, like kind of what you see up here. Okay. And get their name on the banner every year. And, okay. Yeah. So. I like that. What does the loser have to do? Is it like the Waffle House You know, House there challenge? is no punishment, and I tried to uh, institute one because I think there should always be a really good punishment. There should be. I got a little bit of blowback on that, so I'm going to work on that. Um, something like, yeah, the, the loser has to come and like shovel out spent grain at the winner's brewery. Yeah. Something like, yeah, have like some labor some labor behind it. They should also yeah, have to, to clean, clean uh, yeah, un- under the grates of yeah. the, the louder tone. That's, yeah. that's what it should be. Yeah. Uh, and then live stream it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Their sad face put on a can. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. I like the labor part of it. Yeah. yeah. You, you can stuff. You, you're famous for that. This is, yeah, you want grunt work. Um, <laughs> I think cleaning the drains in the cooler would be a good one. I yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Good luck trying to implement that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's the year that you come in last place. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right. the, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm just sort of blown away by, you know, by your list and just the, the, the eclectic nature, um, of it. And it's just, it's fun. Um, aside from check pills, where, what else is sort of in the back of your mind that you want to be experimenting with Hmm. or check or check loggers, I should say. Yeah, lagers in general, um, you know, I love brewing. I think uh, the other challenge is always just, like, continually improving your IPAs. You know, it's, it's frankly, I feel like that's such a hard hard beer to really take to the next level and excel at. Yeah. And, and it's always down to raw materials and the tiniest of little tweaks and how you're implementing them. Yeah. I'm looking at the banners now that you, you brought them to my attention that, they're, that are hanging over your, your, your bar. Um, a lot of awards for Oktoberfest and for a Baltic Porter. Yeah, our Baltic Porter has um, won two GABF medals in somewhat recent yeah, years. Yeah, ni- 19 and 20? Yeah, so yeah. It's a frustrating one because we're always on like the final table and never never get that medal. Well, yeah, medal but <laughs> yeah, you yeah. want the big one. Yeah. Um, I, what is it about a, a Baltic Porter? I don't, I, that's not something that a lot of folks hang their hat on. That's probably my favorite, like, dark beer style. How come? I love it. Oh, it's just, it has all the richness uh, and depth of, like, Imperial Stouts, but the drinkability of a lager. Okay. You know, it's 8%, so it's still a big beer, but it's not going to kill you like a big barrel-aged stout. Um, also, just really challenging to brew, challenging to get a good fermentation on a big lager like that. Yeah. How often are you making it? Uh, just once a year. Okay. Yeah. When does it come out? I guess pre GABF. At this point, we're kind of like brewing it for World Beer Cup, and then we keep it, and it still tastes great for GABF, and it's f- fermenting currently. So, okay, yeah. cool. Um, I've been asking folks on the show for a while now the Green Door question, which is the the premise of uh, the television show The Good Place, and in the final season, they introduce this concept of a green door where the characters can walk through it and be anywhere, uh, doing whatever they want to be doing. And so if we had a green door on our plane of existence uh, and you could walk through it and be at any pub or any brewery anywhere in the world, where would you want to go? Who would you want to be with? And what would you like to be drinking? Oh, wow. Wow. James, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, geez. Uh, <laughs> I think I would really want to go. 
I have not been over there, but I, w- I would really want to go to some amazing beer garden in uh, like Germany, right? Yeah. And just kind of be sitting there, and I'm there with um, God, who am I with? Um, you know, maybe maybe I'm with uh, uh, like Ferran Adria, or I'm like I'm, I'm with uh, um, Rene Redzepi, or somebody who's going to like know everything about food, and then what sort of direction we can go further with beer and food at that point, right? Yeah, um, I think you stole my answer with uh, a German beer garden. I've been having an itching to go back to Augustiner. Yeah. Uh, it's like one of the most beautiful beer gardens I, I've been in. Um, we've been talking about beer gardens a lot lately, and that's the one that always, like, in my head, when I think beer garden, it's, oh, yeah. it's theirs. Yeah. Uh, beautiful pills. Um, yeah, and I, I take you, John. Oh, well, yeah. I, that's, yeah. Uh, you've hosted Brewer to Brewer, and uh, you've, been, you've been on the show, and uh, Mateusz Trum from Schlankelo was just on as a guest and a host uh, in the last couple of weeks. And I came up uh, from listening in on the show because I'm just there in the background listening to the conversation. And he was talking about their beer garden. He was talking about you know their, their their pub and everything. And I came up and I had this goofy smile on my face when I came up from my office. And my wife goes, "What's the matter?" It's like, "I think I need to go to Bomberg immediately." <laughs> and she's like, "You were there three months ago." It's like, "I I think I need to go like right now." Um, it's the most beautiful city. It really I, is. I went to in Germany. Yeah. yeah, but just that sort of culture of the communal beer garden and meeting people and meeting strangers. You t- even in the Czech Republic, you're talking about, you know, mm-hmm. you're sitting at a bar and you get to meet people and you get to have those, th- those, those conversations. Um, there's just something kind of magical about that. Um, do, do you feel something similar happens here with you guys? You know, I, I do like that. We, we kind of have this feeling of just being like a neighborhood corner bar, but we're on the, outskirts of downtown sure. you know and not very many people live around here um so i i do really the enjoy elementary that school aspect. teachers next door don't uh, don't they, stop they in do after stop oh, yeah, they do stop in, in quite yeah. a bit yeah <laughs> so so there is just this kind of like the regulars know each other right yeah and they, they kind of mingle and are swapping tables and stuff like that and it's yeah. just it's kind of an unlikely place for that to happen but it's just been going on for years i like that yeah, no, there's not a lot of like corporate feel to this place at all, right? No. Which is um, unusual for downtown. I like that, but it's it's the vision that you guys that you guys have. Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So where does Noble Beast go from here? Well, we've been poking around at some other ideas, but nothing's quite come to fruition yet. Yeah. But uh, at this point, like, it's just small incremental improvements to this constantly, like. Thinking, how can we do things better across the board? Not just beer and food, but um, you know, with our staff, uh, just customer experience in general. Yeah, I've really been diving back into service and customer experience. Has that changed? I mean, now that COVID's not behind us, but that whole initial lockdown period and uncertainty period, you're able to get back into that service angle that people are coming back out again and rethinking about stuff. Yeah, and I think like things did change a lot then. You know, we moved to a much more um, table service type of model, but then there's also like just weird things that we stopped doing, and we're trying to get back into like, you know, just even like a self-service water station. I don't. Know, there's just a lot of like weird things where like you put the onus on the customer. Yeah. And we're trying to get back to uh, just more hospitality focus. It seems to be what they really want for sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm seeing this QR code on the table, yeah. and that's like the big thing that drives me crazy these days. I mean, I'm a Luddite to begin with, but, you know, there's something about a paper menu. And, and I just agree being with you. Like, to, I, I yeah. hate this, too, and we're still doing it. But, like, it's like we come in, and it's first thing is, like, QR code, get it yourself. You know, we want to stop being, like, do this yourself yeah. uh, to, to the customer. Yeah. But, I mean, especially with the thoughtfulness that you're putting into your food, the thoughtfulness that you're putting into your beer, if I'm on a QR code and reading a description, it's not the same as the conversation with the server, the conversation with you guys about, you know, what's exciting you right now or what's exciting, yeah, it's, Mm -hmm. and it draws people in that sense of community. Yeah, and we don't do any QR ordering. It's just just pulling up the menu. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And then like, you know, it's really important. We have a great front of the house staff, as Sean had talked about before, like, you know, everybody sticks around and whatnot. And so that connection with the guest um, and certainly, um, you know, with the regulars, especially, you know, we can still communicate sort of the passion that we have with everything through them to the guests. Um, and you know, even though they got to, they got to pull up the menu off of the QR code, um, that's still here as well. I like that guys. Thanks for, 
having me here today. Yeah, thanks for having yeah, us. Thank yeah, thanks for sharing your story. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. Time to have a beer. Yes. So what's an innovative way you've seen beer ingredients used in food items? Tell me about it. Or you can just get in touch with questions, comments, or guest suggestions. That email is John Hall, J-O-H-N-H-O-L-L at allaboutbeer.com. A reminder, go visit allaboutbeer.com. Check out the podcast page, the merch page, and read great new content, as well as the archives going back to 1979. And don't forget, you can also follow All About Beer on social media at All About Beer. If you're interested in supporting journalism in the beer space, and I hope you are, you can email us at info at allaboutbeer.com or simply go to patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. Speaking of that. All right. As promised, once again, I'm joined by Ryan Sharp. He is the producer of the Best of Craft Beer Awards, and he's here talking about what makes this competition a cut above the rest and why brewers should get involved. Ryan, there's often a question about uh, when beers are received versus when beers are judged. And I know a lot of brewers try to uh, time up their their submissions and their entries um, with when things hit the table. What's the timeline like for the Best of Craft Beer Awards? Yeah, we, uh, we've really kind of dialed in our process so that we can organize all those bottles and cans in cold storage and get them ready to judge and turn it around in two weeks versus three to five weeks at some of the other large events. And then what about how you communicate with the breweries? Well, we uh, try to hold ourselves to the same uh you know, same level of communication as, as as we do for the judges. And we try to answer calls and emails promptly, whether it's questions about the process or the categories themselves. We kind of want to demystify it so that brewers are confident in how it's run and don't find out after the fact that an entry got bounced because it was in the wrong category or on some other technicality. Yeah. And you offer a lot of feedback as well. We do. Yeah. We give them a uh, uh, table feedback from the mid and middle rounds, as well as the individual judge feedback in the preliminary rounds. But we think there's some additional value to be added in, in those uh, finding out, you know, exactly why a beer did or didn't advance. I like that. What, what have the previous winners or some of the previous winners told you about their experiences with entering into the best of craft beer awards? We're really proud of the number of breweries who come back year after year. Uh, they tell us our competition is a great proving ground before they pay the higher entry fees, a World Beer Cup or GABF. Uh, and they send the brewers to judge with the competition because it's a fun experience and they see it as a professional development, getting exposed to such a wide cross section of beers. And it's pretty good networking too. I like that. All right. So brewers, you now know what to do. Uh, you can register your beers through January 31st, 2024 by visiting the best of craft beer awards.com slash register. Seriously, don't delay. You can learn more about the competition and get your beers signed up by visiting best of craft beer awards.com slash register. As always, please don't forget, All About Beer has that podcast channel. Search and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. Steal This Beer has new episodes every Monday. And the BYO Nano podcast comes out on the 15th of every month. And make sure to check out our original articles on probrewer.com every week. As for this show, Nate Weber does the music. Jeff Quinn designed our logo. And I'm John Hall. New episodes release every Wednesday. And that's when I'm going to be back again to drink beer and to think beer. <laughs>